Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mark Lee. I'll be your MC tonight. We'd like you to stand and welcome our head table guests this evening. Thanks very much. Take a seat, folks. I'd just like to start by saying um, this is a real honor for me to uh, be here tonight. Um, about a month ago, Russ Jackson, a uh, member of the induction committee, gave me a phone call at home and said, Mark, would you mind uh, being our MC uh, here tonight? And I was pretty honored and I said, uh, sure. I hung up the phone and uh, went and talked to my wife in the kitchen. And I said, you won't believe who that was. That was was Russ Jackson. I went into this stream of consciousness, into this flashback to my youth. I grew up in Ottawa and um, I was a little kid when Russ was a star with the Rough Riders back then. And I started to think back to, I mean, I can remember my address, 106 Field Row, my best friend, Paul Neal. We both had black helmets. We got white tape, put the big white R on the side. We had the big number 12. And the only disputes we ever had were over who'd be Russ Jackson. And I was Russ Jackson and my friend was Ron Stewart. And we played forever out in our front yard on Field Row Avenue. I remember in grade five, I did two compositions that year. One was on Bobby Hull, the other was on Russ Jackson. And we knew everything about Russ Jackson. His wife, Lois, we knew that he taught what uh, Sir John A. Macdonald High School, Russ. We had everything on Russ Jackson. He was a huge hero. We even had, I know in my parents' basement right now, somewhere deep in the basement buried, is my old post-serial CFL player cards book. You folks remember those? Remember the, I got a picture of Russ, it's like this. He had the football, right? He had the flat top. Oh, his ears were out a little bit. He kind of reminded me of the Grey Cup back then, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Russ. Guys with the bad poses. Remember those poses? The guys used to get up like this. And Anyways, we had all of those things, and, and, and I just had this flashback to a great uh, time in my life, and, uh, and for, for me to be here tonight um, sort of brings my CFL experience uh, full circle. So. To Russ and everybody on the induction committee, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, last weekend, uh, we were doing a football game on the CFL on CBC in Montreal, and uh, one of the shots we had was a little boy about eight years of age, and uh, he had on number 74, which I think was Peter Delariva's number back then. He had the old red, white, and blue uh, jersey, and I know Peter's here tonight, one of our Hall of Famers. And there he was with his dad, and, and I was struck with a figure that Larry Smith uh, told me about that. 60% of Montreal's fans right now are under the age of 35. And I know that's a demographic that the CFL covets, and I know that all fans are important. But this is a league that, um, well, we really missed a generation in the 90s, and, and I, I, had, I was struck by seeing this young boy that maybe we found another generation, and maybe that boy, uh, several years from now, will have the same heroes and the same nostalgia that I, I feel for the CFL tonight. <laughs> Now it's time to meet our newest heroes and this year's inductees to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. From 1960 to 1981, he cared for the conduct of the game. As an official, a director of officiating, and as a member of the CFL Rules Committee, he earned the respect of not only the players but fellow officials throughout the CFL for his consistency and his high standards of officiating. He appeared in 390 games 
and 10 Grey Cups and remains involved today as a supervisor and a member of the CFL Rules Committee. Would you please welcome this year's inductee into the Builders category, Mr. Donald Barker. Welcome, Donald. For 10 seasons, he patrolled the Montreal Alouettes secondary with a nose for the ball and was twice a Grey Cup champion. His outstanding career as a defensive back began in 1972. He remains the Montreal Alouettes all-time interception leader with 38 and still has the team record for the longest interception return of 118 yards. He was also one of the finest punt returners, returning four of them for touchdowns. Please welcome inductee Dickie Harris in the players category. Welcome, Dickie. And finally tonight, when our next inductee joined the Ottawa Rough Riders back in 1975, with, along with another rookie by the name of Tom Clements, a lot of fans in that area were reminded of a previous quarterbacking tandem of Russ Jackson and Ron Lancaster. This inductee won a great cup in Ottawa in 1976, and again with the Toronto Argonauts in 1983. Please welcome Condredge Holloway. Well, you didn't need that jacket anyway, did you? You get another one here tonight. Last year, folks, the uh, Canadian Football Hall of Fame celebrated the 25th anniversary of uh, the 1974 inductees. Uh, the late Bernie Filoni was the only representative that year able to join us for the Where Are They Now segment of this dinner. Uh, Bernie, as uh, we all know, is no longer with us after a courageous battle with cancer. And now in his honor, let us observe a moment of silence. This time, uh, we'd like to present the inductees with, um, it's kind of like the master's tradition here in the Canadian Football League, that they'd all stand and everyone else can uh, take a seat. We'll call upon uh, three Hall of Famers who will uh, take part in um, the first uh, rite of passage uh, here this evening into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. I'd like to call upon Ralph Sazio, former Ticat and Argo executive, Peter Dallariva, the Alouette's legend, and the Argos' first ever 1,000-yard rusher, Bill Simons, to come up and present these men with their jackets. Make sure you empty your pockets, uh, guys.
It's old homework here tonight. We'd like to also recognize um, Mr. Paul McWinney of uh, Copley Apparel Group, who sponsored this year's jackets. Uh, Mr. McWinney, where are you in the audience tonight? You can stand up and uh, take a bow. Oh, looks like he's not here. <laughs> okay. Thanks anyway, Paul. At a ceremony this afternoon uh, over at the Canadian Hall of Fame, uh, the busts of this year's inductees were unveiled, and we'd like to thank our silver sponsors for their generous support uh, for helping to sustain this tradition. The silver sponsors are recognized in this evening's program. The busts remain on, will remain on display, the ones you see here today, permanently at the uh, Canadian Football Hall of Fame. And, and here's a point of trivia for you. These are the only uh, pieces of sculpture that are made of steel in this country. And that is a tribute to the, uh, the steel-making uh, workers of this city. So there they are, and uh, most sculptures are made of bronze, but these are the only ones. Well, this time we'd like to uh, recognize uh, our head table here uh, tonight, beginning by the man who uh, has created uh, the bus that you see here before us. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Tony Zellman, a sculptor from Souk, B.C. Tony's been doing this now for 28 years and says that the, uh, the business of using steel is a top secret, that nobody else uh, in this country or, or literally in the world uh, knows how they use steel to make these busts tonight, so it's a pretty unique piece of uh, work we have here tonight. Beside him, the uh, Chairman and Acting Commissioner of the Canadian Football League, John Torrey. Representing Jostens Canada Limited, Paul Brule. And representing the city of Hamilton, His Excellency Mayor Robert Morrow. <laughs> to my right, Mr. Reg Wheeler, who is the chairman of this year's induction committee here at the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Representing the regional area of Hamilton Wentworth, Alderman Ron Corsini. And down at the far end of the table, last but not least, the Managing Director of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame and Museum for six and a half years and going, Janice Smith. <laughs> Mr. Wheeler, now if you would be uh, so kind as to uh, bless our evening and our meal tonight. Would you all please stand? Oh Lord, we thank you for allowing us to meet with such great people as are here with us tonight. We thank you for the wonderful weather you've given us for our special events that we've run. We thank you for this bountiful food that we are about to receive and we bless it to our use. Amen. If you'd stay standing, please, and uh, raise your glasses and join me in a toast to the Queen. To the Queen. And to Canada. Thanks very much. Uh, enjoy the, the meal tonight. Larry, all of this is very much appreciated. So let's keep expressing the, the gratitude that we feel, and uh, we can do that best, of course, by buying tickets to games and supporting the franchises and the league as a whole. Uh, but I know my council colleagues here tonight uh, uh, expressed that pride with, with me, and most of them are on the Hall of Fame Management Committee. I'd ask them to stand, uh, Alderman Duco Sullivan at the back of the room, Alderman Terry Anderson, and Alderman Bill Kelly. Please stand. as well as Alderman Ron Corsini, who's representing our regional chairman, who will speak to you in a moment. 
And finally, may I uh, say thanks to David McDonald and George Grant. Uh, this is six years to the day that David McDonald formally uh, became the uh, ultimate leader of our franchise. And uh, that's a, a special anniversary. George came on the scene about a year later, and they're sitting with Neil Lumsden, who had preceded them by about a year and a half. And uh, lo and behold, what wonderful things have happened. Bringing in Coach Lancaster, we're relieved to see in the news tonight he's not going to Regina or somewhere else. We want him just to stay right here forever. He in turn brought McManus and Flutie and uh, Akins, who got four TDs last weekend. And all of these things are just wonderful. And uh, to them and uh, to their predecessors, uh, the ownership uh, groups that have been here over the years, the ones that I have uh, immensely enjoyed working with, uh, Harold Ballard, uh, David Braley, Roger Yacchetti, and the nonprofit group, and of course, uh, David and George, we offer a special thanks. But most of all, to those who have been uh, resolute and loyal fans and supporters over the years. Uh, they're the most indispensable of all. Uh, many in the local area are in this room tonight, along with our special guests from across the country. So to all of you who in any way participate in this great national pastime, uh, this national treasure on behalf of the city of Hamilton tonight uh, here on this Hall of Fame weekend, I want to say a big thanks. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks, Mayor Morrow. I was talking to Conrad Holloway earlier today uh, as his bust was unveiled and uh, we were talking about the great history and tradition that a lot of football fans uh, in this country may not be aware of that the Canadian Football League has. And in fact, the, the big game tomorrow, Toronto-Hamilton, is the longest professional football rivalry in North America. It's something to be proud of and I know it's something that Alderman Ron Corsini uh, is proud of and he's here now to represent the regional municipality of hamilton Wentworth. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I am delighted to be here this evening to represent Terry Cook, chairman of the Hamilton and Wentworth region, who sends his regrets. Let me first congratulate all three uh, recipients being inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. We are proud here in Hamilton to uh, host the Hall of Fame here. You three are in very good company who will be remembered forever. Also, let me welcome you all who, uh, all of you who traveled far from across Canada and the U.S. to be here with us this evening. Any of you who've gotten a parking ticket, just let me or the mayor know. We'll take care of it. <laughs> Today's weather actually was brought to you. Reg Wheeler uh, alluded to that fact about Hamilton's weather we arranged that uh, for you this evening. I believe we have the same on tap for tomorrow to watch the Hamilton Tiger Cats beat the Toronto Argonauts. All right? It's going to happen. Hamilton has a long history and tradition for the Canadian football. I would like to congratulate the organizers uh, for this event. What a class act. Thanks, Reg, and your committee. But really, the important part of this equation is you, the fans, for keeping the spirit of the CFL alive and well in Canada. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the man who has done an outstanding job uh, acting like the commissioner of the CFL, but really isn't the commissioner, would you please welcome the CFL chairman and acting commissioner, John Torrey. Well, uh, Mark and, and uh, honored inductees and head table guests and ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to be here once again this year and I'm, I'm here really on behalf of the Board of Governors of the Canadian Football League and I'd like to bring you greetings from the board. There are several uh, members here tonight. I'd like to just acknowledge their attendance. Uh, Bob Nicholson from the Toronto Argonauts is here somewhere up close to the front. Um, George uh, Grant and David McDonald have been previously introduced and they're over just over this way somewhere and uh, great uh, steadfast supporters of the Ticats and the Argos. Thank you. And uh, David Braley is not here, but David is someone who has a unique record of service to the CFL, and uh, he's unable to be here, but he's someone that certainly deserves recognition in his home uh, 
home community. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I want to begin by congratulating the Hall of Fame and its various committees that uh, looked after the induction, the selection, and uh, all of these festivities on yet another year of successful events. And I also, of course, in particular, want to congratulate the uh, inductees uh, who are going into the Hall of Fame this year. I watched uh, both of the uh, players that are being inducted play. Uh, Conridge, uh, back in those days when I was very young, I started going to Argo games when I was about seven, and I was actually allowed to be an Argo fan in these days, if you forgive uh, that past indiscretion on my part. But um, I certainly watched Conridge play in those days, and of course I watched Dickie uh, Harris play. Um, I think he played with Larry Smith, which must mean that Dickie's about 55 years old himself, although he looks a bit younger. Um, but uh, Dickie, of course, played with the Alouettes in those days and uh, was someone that uh, all of us watched as fans in the CFL. And I had a chance as well to not only watch Don Barker officiate uh, at CFL games, but also to work with him when I became involved with the league as its uh, chairman uh, a number of years ago. And I'll say a, mo a word or two more about him in just a moment. We've had another great season of uh, Canadian football. It really has been a superb uh, year. And I think the importance of tomorrow's game, the fact that it really does matter to the outcome of the 1999 season, is evidence of the good competitive balance that we've enjoyed in the league. There's going to be a good crowd out in Hamilton tomorrow. And I think it's evidence of the strength of that rivalry that Mark referred to uh, earlier. And I think that uh, it reminds us over and over again of the importance. And it's certainly what's kept me going as someone uh, who's been involved with the league for uh, a number of years now the importance of this institution to Canada and to Canadian sports. And I want to say to each and every one of you who show the interest in being here at this event, and I'm sure most of you will be at the game tomorrow, a big word of thanks for your loyalty and for your continuing support uh, for Canadian football. The, the league itself continues to improve. We still have work to do. That's a theme that I guess I've been repeating over and over again during the period I've been involved. We've got lots of work to do to get ourselves to the point where we can uh, declare this uh, organization completely healthy but it's growing in strength uh, each and every day and I think that that has uh, uh, been in large measure because of the work that uh, David and George have done uh, here in Hamilton and I want to uh, pay a particular uh, word of tribute to uh, to Bob Wettenhall and Larry Smith. Larry and Lisa Smith are here uh, tonight and what Larry has done in Montreal is uh, is outstanding. I. Uh, I went down there as whatever I was at the time, chairman and whatever other seem, titles they seemed. I think they give you more titles just to sort of make you think that they really care. But anyway, I, I went down to a meeting in Montreal with Larry and he inherited, I can tell you without question, the worst mess down there that I've ever seen. But I think his pride in Canadian football, his pride in the Montreal Alouettes as an alumnus of that organization gave him determination to go out with Bob Wettenhall's support and do something that's miraculous in terms of that franchise in Montreal, and it's been a great help to the league, and I think he deserves all of our uh, congratulations for everything he's done. There's just one, uh, one other person I would like to single out for some special attention before I do one final thing here, and that is uh, uh, the president of the Canadian Football League, Jeff Giles, who's sitting right over here somewhere. I can't see through the lights, but Jeff, stand up and take a bow over there. People People give me, uh, you know, some of the credit for some of the restoration of the health of the CFL, and I can tell you that uh, if I deserve any of it, it's just a tiny bit. And the guy that's really been in the trenches each and every day, all day, every day, on weekends, nights, and so on, has been Jeff Giles. He's done an outstanding job showing leadership at the league office, and he's responsible for a lot of what's gone on in this league in the last number of years. Now, I have one more thing to do, and I hope that uh, indeed there is someone here. Um, you might think that being an official in the CFL is about the worst job that you could ever have. You know, if you think about it for a minute, I mean, it's not necessarily a job that has big pay. Um, the fans half the time are booing you from the stands. Uh, people from the teams uh, find the odd occasion to, uh, to come by the uh, official's dressing room and, uh, and uh, shout abuse at you if you've been, uh, uh, made a couple of bad calls during the game. Well, I tell you, I sort of felt sorry for them myself until I went down to the playoff game last year in Montreal. And I went down to the playoff game in Montreal, and it was actually quite cold. And uh, Jeff Giles was there with me, and we, uh, Ed Chalupka was there, who, Ed, who also does a super job at the league office. And we needed to get in out of the cold for at least a few minutes at halftime. And so somebody said, well, come on into the official's dressing room. And so we thought this seemed like a relatively you know, inoffensive place to be. You're not supposed to be in anybody's dressing room or showing any favoritism to one person or another. And uh, I actually thought it would be pretty boring in there, to be frank. 
So we went into the official's dressing room, and uh, we were just trying to get out of the cold for a minute, and we're in there for about two minutes, and this door opens at the other end of the room, and we find out, and this is the kind of thing they just don't tell you about. You know, they keep these secrets. They find, we find out that in the Montreal McGill Stadium, the official's dressing room is connected to the cheerleader's dressing room by a door. And I'm not in there three minutes that the cheerleaders don't start filing into the official's dressing room. So, uh, look, I really have nothing more to say. I'm not at liberty to discuss any more aspects of this, to be frank. But um, it, it really evaporated any sympathy that I had for Don Barker and all the other people who over the years have been officials in this league. But notwithstanding that, one of the things we wanted to do tonight, in addition to seeing Don sworn into the Canadian Football League Hall of Fame, was to retire his official's jersey that he wore for so many years with such distinction and good grace. And so... Come on up here, Don. So what it says here is that um, the Canadian Football League proudly retires the sweater number of Don Barker upon his induction to the CFL Hall of Fame, October 1999. Don, well-deserved. Congratulations. He'll get a chance to speak later, and I think there should be a question period where you can ask him about that dressing room in Montreal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, each year at this dinner, we um, mark the 21st, 21st, 25th anniversary of previous Hall of Famers. And in 1975, six members were inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Tonight, we remember and honor them. Four are now deceased. Lou Heyman was enshrined as a builder, devoting 44 years to Canadian football, a service interrupted only by a term as wing commander in the RCAF. In 1933, Lou Heyman was only 25 years old and a coach of the Toronto Argonauts, and he won the first of five Grey Cups. Lou Heyman never lost a Grey Cup game he coached in. Wherever you are, Lou, here's to you tonight. Tom Brook joined the hall as a builder in 1975. He was an executive and a director with the Calgary Stampeders in the post-World War II era. In 1948, he hired a man by the name of Les Lear and recruited new talent. Brooke personally guaranteed their salaries, which doesn't sound much different than these days, 50 years ago, and the Stampeders actually went on to win the Grey Cup, their first in 1948. Here's to Tom Brook. Byron Bailey, better known as By Bailey, was a member of the first BC Lions team in 1954. He played for 11 years. He was an all-Western fullback and later one of the country's best defensive backs. In 1964, he won a Grey Cup. The late By Bailey, a charter member of the BC Lions. Herb Trowick was one of the first imports selected when Lou Heyman and Leo Danderan were rebuilding the Montreal Alouettes back in the 1940s. He played for 12 seasons and seven times he was an Eastern All-Star. Herb Trowick remains one of the few linemen ever to score a touchdown in a Grey Cup game. Here's to Herb Trowick, folks. Now two Hall of Fame inductees back in 1975 are with us tonight. Would you please welcome Kenny Plain and Dick Shadow. Kenny Plain piloted the Blue Bombers from 1957 to 1967. In his rookie year, he was a Rose Bowl champion and a Grey Cup champion. That was his first of four Grey Cups in Winnipeg. Dick Shadow had a stellar career with the Toronto Argonauts from 1954 to 1965. At fullback, halfback, slotback, flanker, he established 15 Toronto Argonaut records. I'd like to call upon Kenny Plain and Dick Shadow now to come and get your 25th anniversary rings. I'd also like to call on Gord Perry to make the presentation. Gord Perry played for the West and the Montreal Winged Wheelers back in the mid-1920s. 
in 1930s. They say he had great speed and was hard to catch at running back, and he still looks like he's hard to bring down at 96 years of age. Come on up, Gord. Kenny, come on up and say a few words. I didn't realize I wanted to. I was told, uh, if you would. <laughs> anyway, first let me pass on congratulations to the new inductees, Don, Dick, and Conridge, the new class of 1999 from the old class of 1975. And if you've got a problem telling us apart, well, just look, we're the guys with the classy gold jackets. They're wearing those black drab ones. <laughs> I'm pleased and honored to be asked to say a few words on behalf of the 1975 inductees. It seems like only yesterday that I sat up here with Bye Bailey, Tom Brook, Lou Heyman, Herb Trawick, and Dick Shadow. And although by Tom, Lou, and Herb are no longer with us, our thoughts, prayers, and their memories will remain with us forever. Each time, like this morning and later on this afternoon that I visit the Hall of Fame here, the place just drips with memories and nostalgia. And I know if all the guys were here from that 1975 class, they would like me to say on their behalf something like this. Dear CFL Hall of Fame Induction Committee, this thanks for you. Thanks for recognizing the sport that we love to play. Thanks for recognizing our abilities. Thanks for recognizing our accomplishments. But mostly, thanks for recognizing and preserving some of Canada's heritage, the Canadian Football League. And oh yeah, there's a PS. One more thing, they said if you're talking to the powers that be, well, tell them from us, don't change the game. We love three-down football. We love a wide and long football field. We love the rouge, and we love the 12 players on each side and we love the Canadian player content. And most of all, we love the Grey Cup played in Canada, East versus West. Signed, proud and honored to be part of the history of the CFL, the class of 1975. So in closing, <laughs> thanks again to the Hall of Fame Induction Committee and all their volunteers for having Dick Shadow and our wives back to this year's induction ceremony. Your thoughtfulness, kindness, and hospitality was first class as usual. The wearing of this CFL Hall of Fame ring will be a constant reminder of the honor bestowed, not only on Dick and I, but you honor our families, our friends, and our fans, and you honor the teams that we represented. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kenny. Congratulations. Well, now it's time to bring this year's inductees into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Beginning with Donald Barker, who's still involved in the game, still acting as a game supervisor and a member of the CFL Rules Committee. This follows a 21-year career as a game official. Don was always fair but consistent with his calls and maintained a high standard of officiating. And for that, he won respect 
through this. Don, with this plaque, we mark your induction into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, Chairman Reg, head uh, table guests, and my fellow inductees, Conridge and, and Dick. This is indeed a great honor. On uh, reflection, I think this could be the shortest uh, Hall of Fame speech in history, because after I listened to John Tory talk about the dressing room in, in Montreal, I think I'm going to make a comeback. And I can assure John that when I was running the show, we wouldn't allow it. Well, maybe we would, but we wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> this is really an, an, indeed an intriguing situation. And early in the year when the nominations were made, I was talking to one of my neighbors and he congratulated me and we said farewell to each other. And as I was walking away, he called me back. He said, hang on a minute, now I got a couple of questions for you. He said, are you sure that they're going to let an official get into the Hall of Fame? And I got him settled down and I said, yeah, there's, a, there's some great ones there prior to me. And then he came up with another one and he said, why in the world would a man who seems to be in his right mind hang around officiating in professional football for 39 years and football generally for probably 45 or 50. You know, and I walked away from him and I really didn't know the answer. I wasn't really sure why I would subject myself to that kind of punishment. And a, a few minutes later, I, it came to me. And the thing about this game in Canada, it's all about people. It's the people you associate with. They're such wonderful people that you just, it's hard to walk away and retire. And I just want to spend a minute or two with you categorizing some of the people that I have run into in over my career in the CFL. And I want to start with the Hall of Fame committee here in Hamilton, the founders who were men of great vision, obviously, uh, the Tiger Cat alumni who put on a tremendous golf tournament yesterday, it was fabulous. Uh, Chairman Reg and his current committee, and Janice Smith and her staff, and of course the volunteers down at the Hall of Fame in Hamilton. This has been a most enjoyable weekend, something I will never forget, and I want to thank them on behalf of myself, my wife, my family, it really has been a tremendous occasion. Then I go on to the people that I worked with. And when I look around the room, it's a little scary because there's about four generations of them. And there's fellows I broke in with, fellows that I officiated with, fellows that I worked with in the latter part of my career and the earlier part of theirs. And then, of course, some younger men who uh, we were lucky enough to recruit, train, and bring them on, and I guarantee you they're going to be great football officials. I once want to touch briefly on all of those categories, the first being the older fellows who I worked with. And there are three, actually three officials who preceded me into the Hall of Fame on their officiating uh, careers only. And two of them were supervisors, Andy Curry and Hap Scholleis. And the other was Paul Dojak. Now, Paul suffered with me for a couple of years until I learned all his bad habits. And when I caught on, he thought, well, I'll turn it over and let Barker run the show. Paul taught me many things. And the main thing he taught me is how to sound like you're six foot six when you're only really five foot eight. He could do that. He demanded respect. And then there's other chaps here who I worked with. And some of them, are many of them in the room here tonight. And I'm thinking of Gord Johnson and Boyd Cooper and Billy Dell and all those great guys that were just fine officials. And then the younger gang who are coming along and doing a great job. And they learned 
from me. Hopefully we taught them a little bit once in a while, but they were, are, and will be, I'm sure, great officials in the Canadian Football League for many years to come. Then I want to turn on to the players. Most people, I read a couple of books by officials in baseball and, and hockey, and for some reason it seems to be that there's a constant war going on between the player and the official. You know, in all the years I worked in this league, I don't think I can remember a serious run-in with a player. We didn't always agree, but I think we respected each other. And that is something I'm very, very proud of. And this may sound hard to believe, but in 22 seasons in this league, I never ever gave a talking penalty or a sportsmanlike coffee. And I'm proud of that. And I had a very simple philosophy, and I didn't, I don't say this to many people, but my theory on officiating was blow the whistle, get out of the way, and let the players play. And usually they do. I said usually because once in a while they'll try on for size and you've got to tie them up and straighten them out. But usually they do. And I'm sure that players respect the tough job that we've got, and I guarantee you that I respect the job that they do. When you think about football players, and, and these are big men, and they're just hammering each other for an extended period of time on a very hot afternoon, and they have complete control of their emotions, they stay in the game, and they provide great entertainment. Over the years, obviously, I've had the opportunity to share the field with many, many, many tremendous football players. They were the show. We were the stagehands. And when you go back to the early days with Jack Parker and John Bright, all those fellas, working their way up through uh, Russ Jackson, Ron Lancaster, Clements, you name it, you could go on forever. This league has really been blessed with some tremendous athletes. And it can, carries on today. The fellows we have are tremendous fellows. And uh, we should appreciate them and support them. And I assure you, there is final, there is certainly mutual respect. I want to go on to the fans. And firstly, I want to thank them for all the assistance and all the suggestions that they made over the period of time I was in the league. Now, some of them were probably very difficult to carry out, but I assure you I, I, assure you I appreciate them. They were, I'm sure they were all well meant. But when you leave the thing, you think back to special people. And there, there's a guy in Winnipeg, and he used to, we used to go through a tunnel. In the, I think they still do. This guy sat right above the tunnel, and he had a voice that I'm sure you could hear him in Vancouver. And most time when you're fishing, if you're doing a good job of fishing, you don't even really know who won the game. But I always knew, when you walk through that tunnel, this guy would lean over the rail and he'd say, great game, Barker, you did a great game out there. Winnipeg must have won. <laughs> if you walk through that tunnel, you bum. You screwed us again, I guess they lost. <laughs> but he was faithful, and I have a theory. As long as he plays to get, pays to get in the park, <clears throat> he can say anything he wants. And another time I, <clears throat> I thought about the fans is we were working a playoff game in Regina, and it was actually 14 below Fahrenheit. And the wind was blowing out of the northwest at 40 miles an hour. It was a, just a horrendous day. And I think Larry Robinson kicked the field goal on the last play to put the team in the Great Cup. And I remember standing out there in the third quarter while we were having one of our mandatory <laughs> television timeouts, and, and I thought, what am I doing here? You know, this is insane. <laughs> and then I look up at the crowd, and there's this multitude of people, and they're sitting there, and they're freezing. They're freezing. And I thought, what the heck? What am I complaining about? If they're willing to pay 
to be tortured. Why should I complain when I'm getting money? And that's the way fans are. They're great people. Of course, once in a while they get mad at you and they, they, they don't always agree with your decisions. But that's part of the game and we learn to live with that. It's a strange thing that Vern Heath had mentioned the situations of the speaker at Edmonton, because I was going to make reference to that. But however, I'll, I'll bypass that one and go on to a few other things that I have down here. We had a, a group of people in a few years past that we call trainers. They're now, they've gone a little bit above that. Now they're, they're uh, athletic therapists. But the trainers were really great characters. And people, they asked me, how can you, how could you guys work with five officials and I got to use seven now? Well, it was easy. We had five guys on the field and the two trainers. These guys could officiate like you wouldn't believe. They were wonderful characters. And I thought back to some of the names. A guy named in Vancouver that worked there for years, his name was Rocky Cavill. Well, Rocky, what does that tell you? I never saw a fight that Rocky didn't think was great. And there's another guy that worked out of here, Ray Jones. Who can forget? The impact of Ray Jones running across the field with these multi-colored suspenders on, go to tend to a, to a uh, an injured player, or Freddie Dunbar up in Toronto, just a tremendous character, great guy, great guy. But my Hall of Fame goes to Sandy Archer. Maybe you, most of you won't remember Sandy Archer, but Sandy was an absolute officiating genius. And every time there's a Saskatchewan injury, injury, Sandy would come charging onto the field, and he said, I saw that, you got clipped. And I don't see a flag. What's going on out here? And we used to just kind of stand there and watch him, and say, oh, Sandy, how are you doing? So this particular day, there's a Saskatchewan player on his hands and knees, out on the far side of the field, and two or three of his teammates were standing down there, leaning over as if they were talking to him. Away comes, comes in Sandy, and he's on about clipping. I saw that, the guy was clipped. He comes charging up to the player, and one of these teammates says, hold on, Sandy, we're looking for a contact lens. <laughs> and the official that happened to overhear it, he said, man, that must have been some clip. <laughs> but he was a wonderful fellow. Something else we're losing now is our captains, team captains. Back a few years ago, the, the team captain was an honest-to-goodness captain. Great fellas. I can think of lots of them. Ron Lancaster, Russ Jackson, Normie Fieldgate, Wayne Harris. Those fellas were so quick, they used to give, explain the rules to us, and we'd give them the options. It was a great arrangement. But we took this thing of captains, and we had a rule that... Uh, the player couldn't talk to an official. He had to talk to his captain, who would then talk to the referee and get the thing straightened out. Well, that worked like magic. A player, by the time he found the captain, and the captain found the referee, we normally had another play going, and they never did, never did get a hearing. The other thing these fellows did, they were uh, our best friends. If we had a problem with a player, and we, we had that occasionally, we'd go to the captain. He'd say, listen, that guy's giving us a hard time out here. You better get him straightened out. And they would. Now, when you think of some of the captains, I always think of John Barrow. You ever seen John? John was a big, big man. And I, I don't think anybody would ever argue with John Barrow. If he told him to keep quiet, the guy kept quiet. And I'm getting down now, but we're going to talk about coaches. And I'll tell you, some of those fellows were a work of art. But I, a funny thing happened when I got into being the supervisor of officials in, in the CFL, I suddenly understood why coaches got so agitated. And you've got to picture the situation they're in. They spend a, a whole week planning a game plan, telling players to do things that they want them to do and not do things that they don't want them to do. And then come day game, yeah, pardon me, uh, game day, 
stand on the sidelines and watch them do things that they told them not to do and not do things that they asked them to do. And when I was a supervisor of officials, something similar used to happen to me on occasion. And I suddenly realized how coaches got so agitated. And I think if I were going to do this again, I'd be supervisor first and then officiate later, because it, it really was an eye opener. But coaches came in a variety of sizes and temperaments. We had guys who were the quiet coaches. Guy who never spoke was Eagle Keys. Like he never spoke to anybody. Well, never officially. Yeah. Then we had Bud Grant. And Bud Grant didn't say very much but he had a stare that would freeze you. I think Bud Grant was probably the first cat scan in Canada. <laughs> he could look right through you. He, he was a tough bird. And then we had a fellow that, uh, if he were come along a little later, he'd be probably uh, Canada's answer to the horse whisperer. And that was Huey Campbell. And you would get up behind you and he'd just whisper in your ear. And uh, it, it was really a lot of fun. Then we had some talkers. I don't know why all the talkers came from down east, but they did. Can anybody remember Leo Cahill? How about Al Bruno? Now there was a guy who could talk. Now I have a favorite coach also. And he's a fellow who didn't coach a long time in the league, but he coached in Winnipeg for a few years. And prior to each year, we send out a set of forms for the coaches to make comments on officiating decisions. And Mike Riley phoned up and he said to me, what are these things for? And I said, well, you know, if you have a situation where you think officiating decision was incorrect or whatever, you send in the report, we'll look at it, and we'll get back to you. He said, ah, I don't think I'm going to do that. He said, I have a standard. And my standard is this. When the officials make more mistakes than my players and my coaches, I'll talk to you. And I never heard from him. And I thought that was a, a real tribute to a guy who, who uh, would uh, have that standard, and he did. He really, uh, in my opinion, was the ultimate official. The other thing that I want to just touch on very quickly is the emotional things that go on a football field. And you, don't, you can't realize it unless you're out there. And something that I still visualize was a play in 1975. And it happened in McMahon Stadium, Calgary, up near the north end zone, when a Hamilton player, defensive player, was injured. And those of us on the field had been around long enough to know that this was a very serious situation. We could tell. And eventually, uh, not too long after he got in the hospital, the young man passed away, sadly. But uh, the emotion that, that racked the players on the field at that time was something I'll never, ever forget. And even though football is a game, it also is life. And. Uh, that did more than me to ensure that I kept things in perspective. And that's what I want to close with, is there a, another group of people with us here tonight. They're not large, but they certainly are the most wonderful people in the world. And I happen to be lucky enough to have a, a partner who has a very subtle way of keeping things in perspective. And I think that's so important. And I think in our enthusiasm to play the game or officiate the game, sometimes we lose sight of what really is important in life. Anyhow, this woman is just the greatest person in the world. And uh, she's accompanied by four equally impressive young women. And I just want to thank Giselle and our four daughters, Linda, Margaret, Beverly, and Jocelyn for their patience and their kindness and their understanding over what was 
obviously them some some very difficult times i want them to know i appreciate them and i love them a great deal There's a couple other fellows I want to mention. There's so many officials that I worked with that I, we just can't go on. There's a whole table of young men here that I, I adore greatly. But there's two fellows who over the last 15 years I've grown to know as friends and to rely on as cohorts. And it's kind of dark up there, but there's one guy I'd like to stand up if you don't mind, and that's Neil Payne. Neil is just my best friend. He's a great guy and a great official. Now there's one other fellow who probably doesn't go back quite as far into the inner workings of this mysterious business as Neil does. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us tonight, but I want to also bring to your attention a fellow by the name of Ross Perry. He is a great fellow. A wise man told me, no matter when you retire, you should have a wish list. Mine is very, very short. And the thing I would like to, first thing I would like to see happen is a crew of about four newspaper reporters and three television guys attempting to officiate a football game. <laughs> and just to make sure things are run properly, we might even let Marty York referee. <laughs> and my second wish is that I can get in the broadcast booth with Mark Lee and do the play-by-play. -play. Now that would be fun. In closing, I just want to thank everybody that's involved in football in, in this great country and uh, tell you that I have enjoyed every minute of it and uh, the accolades I got tonight. Nobody ever told me that before, so, you know, they really mean something very special to me. I want to thank you all, wish you well, and may God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Don, and uh, you're welcome to come up and uh, pay us a visit tomorrow uh, in the broadcast booth between the uh, Cats and the Argos. And I'll tell you, Don, you just made it. I nearly had to flag you for a time count violation. <laughs> okay, Dickie Harris. Dickie, as I mentioned off the top, I grew up in, Ho in Ottawa. And I'm, I mean, you guys, the Alouettes were mud in my house. I was ejected from my own family room by my own father for unsportsmanlike conduct. I believe it was the 77 East final when you guys beat Ottawa. That's how much we detested you, but we respected you, we booed you, and tonight we honor you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dickie Harris. I guess uh, it all starts with the family. Uh, my mother and father have passed away. I know they're up there watching tonight. But uh, there were two uh, great parents that uh, were there all the time. I don't think they missed hardly a game in my career, starting with Pop Warner to high school to college. I know my father a lot of times would uh, take off work at a Friday afternoon and drive 12 hours to South Carolina to see a game and turn around, get in the car and drive back to be home for work on Monday morning. Uh, uh, both my father and my mother, like I said, were there all the time. Uh, without them, uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. Uh, my brother's here tonight. My brother was uh, a great athlete four years ahead of me. Uh, he was the one that set the bars uh, very high, uh, something always to go uh, try to attain. Uh, my brother went to South Carolina. I followed him down. Unfortunately, my brother had a, a knee injury in his junior year, which enabled him not to play anymore. But far as a, a role model, uh, a great brother, 
I couldn't ask for anybody any, any better. Affectionately known as Chultzy, I love you. Thanks for being here tonight. My sister, uh, when I grew up, they didn't have uh, athletics for girls very much. But uh, same thing, she was always there, just a great sister. She uh, blossomed later in life. She's now run eight marathons, so every time I think of a marathon, my knees start to ache. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, as Larry said, I'm behind every good man there is a, a good woman, and this is certainly no exception in my behalf. Uh, she's not only a great mother uh, and a wife, she's also a director of care at an intermediate facility and, and does a great job in Kelowna for the elderly. Uh, proud of you, Dick. I love you. Uh, wouldn't be here without you. She's given me three lovely daughters, oldest being Lauren, 19. Allison, 17, and the baby, Christina, 14. Uh, very seldom do you get a chance in public to uh, tell your kids how much you appreciate them and how much you love them. They're very beautiful and talented girls, and uh, I couldn't ask for anything better. Going on to the in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> Larry and Lisa, uh, just great people. Uh, I don't know whether I should leave the story the way it is that Larry told it. It's not the truth. <laughs> I think it might have been the other way around, but uh, we'll leave it at that, Larry. Uh, I'll still have one up on you, okay? Uh, Charlie and Terry are here tonight, Elizabeth's other brother. Uh, I think there are three kids, Charlie, Lindsay, and Andrew are here. Uh, just a great family not too long ago, about a week ago or a week and a half, we Charlie had his 50th surprise birthday party and it was just a great time. Charlie, I'll never quite be as old as you, buddy. <laughs> Alan and his uh, lovely wife, Evelyn, uh, Evelyn, just had twins a little while ago, so I know Big Al's going to not be getting too much sleep. Alan also played for Toronto and Calgary for a number of years and just a great guy. Al, thanks for being here and you, Evelyn, too. The football aspect, which is the other family. You know, I started it uh, in Pop Warner, the age of 12 and 13. Uh, where I grew up was uh, just a great area. Uh, I've been very fortunate all through my career where, I've, where I started in Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey, uh, both at Pop Warner, then high school, and then moving on to South Carolina, and then Montreal. The people in Point Pleasant were, were great. They were always behind you. I uh, had a great coach at a young age in the name of Purse Arnone. Uh, I got to high school, had another great coach, both uh, in football was Al Michigan and track was a gentleman by the name of Dave Oxenford. I went to South Carolina where I had Paul Dietzel. Uh, and in South Carolina I had a great, I think it really dawned on me that what matters in life too is, is your players, your friends, the character of the team and everything else. And I must say at South Carolina, we won the AC championship in 1969, and I just went back to a 30-year reunion. It's the last time we won a championship, by the way, but 80% of the guys showed up. It was quite amazing. Uh, Larry Smith just put on a reunion in Montreal just a short period ago, too. We, I think we had 85 guys. Uh, the testament to the type of players we had, the character we had on the team, the respect we had for each other, I think it came down to no one wanted to let down the other players. And I think that's what really builds championship teams. I know talking to people like Kenny Plain uh, earlier in, in, in the, when I arrived here and some other players, I mean, we all seem to agree that character is what really makes championship teams. And uh, it's something I've been very fortunate to be uh, a part of. Uh, many of the guys, there's, I know a bunch of guys here tonight. I know Gordon Judges, Glenn Weir, Gary Chowan, Doug Smith, Terry Evanson, Paul Brule, Peter Della Riva, and Larry Smith. You guys are great. I mean, you're, we're all part of a team that's, uh, I think will continue uh, not only when we played, but you know, with, like here tonight and after, and that's, that's really what it's all about. I guess what really uh, struck me too was when my father passed away uh, a few years back and uh, at his funeral, uh, a small town of 5,000 people, Point Pleasant Beach, and the turnout that came out for my father's funeral. Now, he was a member of the fire company, the, the, the first aid, and like they stopped the funeral, I mean, in the town, like they shut the lights down and they, and they did everything. And my father 
just had so many friends. And I think if you, uh, the testament to any man, I think when you end up at the end of your life is, you know, how many friends you had, because that's really the most important thing. I look at tonight's honor as, as an individual honor, I guess, but it's really a, a team achievement. And the team is all my players that I've played with before. I mean, without them, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Uh, in closing, uh, again, I want to thank the CFL. It's just been a great time. I'm looking forward uh, to the rest of the festivities and the game tomorrow. And uh, it's, just gonna, it's just been great. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dick. If you thought uh, Dickie's first date with Elizabeth was a great deal, you ought to hear Larry tell a story of the first night he met her family. But I, I won't tell that story, Dickie. I, I won't, no. The night you walked up the front walk in, in the dark, stepped in the dog dirt, and then went 101 yards on his future mother-in-law's white carpets. <laughs> it all worked out, though. Condridge Holloway, in his rookie year, he was a hit right off the bat, right out of Tennessee in Ottawa. He became the CFL prototype, from spread out to run and shoot. He thrilled fans throwing to receivers like Tony Gabriel in Ottawa and Terry Greer in Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Condridge Holloway. So that era in, in, in Toronto, along with Willie Wood bringing me here, Coach Bob Obilovich having the confidence in me to, to name me a starter, and, and bring in some people that were, would help me win. Then along came a guy that just rejuvenated my career. I mean, Daryl Mouse Davis turned 120 sacks into 29 in one year with an offense called the run and shoot. Uh, did I like it? Oh yeah, I enjoyed that very much. It rejuvenated my career. It's probably why I'm standing here today along with Terry Greer, Emmanuel Tobert, uh, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Tobit, Paul Pearson, Jan Carinci, and Cedric Mentor because that offense was just electric with all of our offensive linemen. And then Don Matthews out in BC, I spent my last year out there and everybody says, well, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about Don Matthews for? This, this guy cut you. He said that Greg Vavra was a better quarterback than you and he cut you. What do you mean talking about him? Well, tell you what, Don Matthews prepared me for the rest of my life. There's a lot of us guys that think we're bulletproof. But there's a time when you got to realize you got to do something else. You got to go on with your life. And I'm the type of guy that I would never steal from the CFL. And what I mean by that is if I can't be the best or the second best or right there close to third as a quarterback, I don't want to take money for that because that's stealing. And that's the way I feel about it. And Don Matthews point blank said to me, we're well, going to go in a different direction. And it prepared me for the rest of my life, which has been okay. I'm enjoying where I am right now. And last but not least, um, you know, there's, there's always a lot of things that you, you contribute to being successful. But good coaches, great family, and great players that you played with or played against are the reason that you are successful. Because when you play against great players, there's only two ways you go. You either get better or you get worse. You can't stay the same because if you stay the same, you get released and you're known as FC. That's called future considerations, which means they send you someplace and the future considerations is you come back to them. It happens, believe me, everybody knows what I'm talking about. So the great players that I've played against and with are just phenomenal. Uh, you know, I think about Ottawa, the Supi Campbell, there was Mark, Co Mark Cosmos, there was Tony Gabriel, Tommy Clement, Jim Foley, you know, I come to Toronto, great players. I mean, I mentioned them before, uh, Terry Greer, you know, and it, it was just, I played against some of the best opposing players, and, and as a quarterback, you sit there and you see faces all the time, because you're the one under the center, you're looking out, and you don't know what it's like to look in the face of a Granny Liggins and a Bruce Smith that are not very happy, and they want to hurt you. Ben Zambiazzi, Carl Cornell, uh, John Helton out at Calgary. This is not a pretty sight, folks. I can tell you that. I survived, but I survived because 
they made me better because if I wasn't going to get better, I was going to get worse. So I, I really thank them. And I, at this time, I want to close by asking all the people that are here to see me and in, uh, here on behalf of me to stand up. And I'd like to say something to, would you please stand, please? My mom, my dad, my friends, my teammates, just stand for just one second. And what I'd like to say is, on behalf of my family, my friends, my teammates, I'd like to say to the CFL committee, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to the country of Canada. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to come up and play a sport and play a position that I felt I deserved to play without hassle and give me an opportunity to enjoy your country and all your cities. And I stand before you very, very humble, very, very appreciative, a little bit heavy, but a Hall of Famer. Thank you. You hear the whole thing? Yeah, his dad heard the whole thing. All right. By the way, we'd like to note that the uh, plaques that all three of our inductees received tonight um, were uh, courtesy of DeFasco Limited here in Hamilton. Thanks. <clears throat> I'd like to call upon Paul Brule now of Johnston's Canada Limited to come forward and present our three Hall of Fame inductees with their Hall of Fame rings. Paul? Uh, the ring is the thing. And on behalf of Jostens Canada, the manufacturers of the rings, I'm very proud tonight to have the opportunity to present our inductees with their 1999 Hall of Fame rings. And I start with uh, Don Barker, if you'd please come up. Dickie, would you please come up? <laughs> Connie, come on up, buddy. Thanks, Paul. Well, once again, this has been uh, a wonderful dinner full of uh, tradition and emotion, and um, it's time now we call upon Reg Wheeler, the chairman of the inductee dinner com committee, for his remarks. And uh, Reg, we'd like to thank you and the committee for uh, once again uh, providing us with a great dinner. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank you, Mark, for doing a great job for us. And, um, while I was sitting here thinking, it's, ama it's amazing, you know, when you're planning a meeting like this, to say, well, we were supposed to have four, we've ended up with three inductees. Geez, the night is gonna go like a shot. What are we gonna possibly do to fill in the time? Uh, it's, it's gonna take somebody to fill in, so I figured out what I'd say, and I got a great speech already, and there's no time for it. Uh, uh, the time is gone, and so are a lot of people. And it struck me when I heard Kenny Plain give his little talk about the men that are missing from the group that went in to the Hall of Fame when he did. And I remember them all being at this head table because we've been doing this for 27 years. And I want you to know and understand when you read in your, please take your program and read it. One of the things you must read, of course, is the sponsors in the back. Now, that, that's boring reading. But these are the people that support this thing. They're the people that make it work, regardless of all the work that everybody else does. If you haven't got the money to make it work, you can't put it on. There's the induction planning committee and the working committee and everything else, and I hope you read all their names. But 
When we were going through the thinking tonight, we had a moment of silence for one of the greatest players that ever put on the cleats and played on the Canadian gridiron. And we uh, had a moment of silence for him, and that's as it should be. He was a great, great man. In his, he came up here from Maryland and was a great citizen of this country, put his roots down, formed a business, raised a family, was a taxpayer, which means a whole lot to us these days, and uh, made sure that his roots were strong and his family stayed on while he has unfortunately passed away. But we've got many other people that did the same thing. One of them was Jimmy Smiley, who didn't come from a foreign country, but he was a born uh, in this area and a great football player with the old Tigers, a great athlete, and I've written a little bit about him in memoriam, and please read that, because I don't want to read it again tonight. But this dinner was started, and read that, how it started, by old football players that love the game of football. And they put in hours after hours, they bugged their friends to buy tickets to come to the dinners, and it was just a constant war with everybody to get this put on. It's four of them that I want to particularly mention are Hardy Ori, Jimmy Stewart, Donnie Toms, Bud Donald, and above all, the man I wrote about, Jim Smiley, who just passed away about three weeks ago. And when I was thinking of these fellas, if you would just bear with me for a moment, it's fall and the leaves are falling and it's a great time for us as family people to do a little bit of reminiscing and thinking. And so I call this breaking leaves. Fall creeps quietly upon us. It paints the leaves gold, red, and brown. The wind plucks them from the branches and sends them whirling to the ground. Once they're down, the wind keeps at them, moving them from here to there, packs them tight against the hedgerow and underneath the veranda stair. Every day, the piles get greater as more leaves leave their former haunt till the last of them has fallen and the trees stand bare and gaunt. On the ground, new piled together, they huddle in the autumn sun, turned over now and then by breezes, making sure the drying's done. We put on our old windbreaker, now somewhat ragged at the sleeves, and stride forth to do our duty, breaking up the fallen leaves. As we work, we get to thinking. We feel peaceful as we take notice of their friendly rustle when we pull them with our rake. Over from the schoolyard yonder comes a very pleasant noise all the sharp, excited yelling of some football playing boys. Our thoughts drip back to that sweet time, back when we had time to play, back when our energies were boundless and the days seemed longer in some way. We remember those we played with. We sort of choke to realize those young bucks who ran and tackled are now some ancient kind of guys. When we dig it back a bit more deeply, we realize that some have gone. We start to call some of their names off. The list, alas, goes on and on. We think of things we did together, the fun we had when we were kids. We have to smile when we remember all the crazy things we did. The thought strikes us as we keep breaking how much we resemble these. First in bud, then in a green state, strongly tied to family trees. Life paints us in various colors. Some are bright and some dull brown. Some are golden, some like amber, and some bright red to show renown. But no matter what the color, when the wind of fate blows free, each of us is by appointment. Let's slip our grasp on our own tree. Each of us had our share of glory hanging up there on our bow. But no matter what our greatness, things all even up somehow. 
So we rake the leaves and bag them, take them to the compost heap, where they will complete their cycle, which will take place while they're asleep. When nature has reworked and shaped them into black earth once again, we will put them round the roots of all the trees from which they came. Our thoughts continue as we do this. God, in his mysterious way, does the same thing with we humans after we have lived our day. When we are gone, some might remember. Perhaps from our life they gain some worth. Perhaps this world is somehow better for us having been upon this earth. We, like these, have just one lifetime in which to do the best we can. If by being here we helped a little, then, like leaves, we're a part of God's great plan. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank every one of you for coming here tonight and taking part in this great celebration for these great men. We look forward to the millennium next year when we're going to put on, we hope, the biggest dinner we've ever had for an induction. And we want every one of you to come back and bring all your friends and we'll open the door of the third room at the back end and fill this hall completely. Until then, we thank you once again and wish you all Godspeed, and we'll see you next year. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Reg. That's it, folks. And I was just thinking while we we're watching those videos tonight, how inspiring it is to, to see the, the great athletic feats of players like Condredge and, and Dickey and, and referee Don Barker. But you know, it's even better to watch it in person. And, and who knows? Pinball Clements, Mike O'Shea, Danny McManus, Darren Flutie. They're out there tomorrow. And I know they could count on your support, too. Hope to see you at the ballgame tomorrow. The Argos and Ticats, thanks for coming tonight. Good night.